In this video, we're going to be talking about bioterrorism and disasters. Welcome to CASRN, where I teach you about all things nursing. Bioterrorism is a terrorism involving biological agents that cause disease, disability, and or death. So it's important for the community health nurse. It's important for the community health nurse to be able to recognize that bioterrorism. So what you might see is an increased incidence of disease, an uncommon disease for your area, such as if you lived in the United States and there was an area that was getting Ebola, an uncommon uncommon endemic. So this means that it's a disease that normally occurs in your area, but it's an uncommon time for it to be happening, such as getting the flu during the summer. It's not very common for that to show up. And then if you're seeing diseases that have a high mortality rate with similar symptoms or a high rate of similar symptoms in your area. So the role of the community health nurse is to participate in planning and preparation for bioterrorism, identify the use of biological agents if that's happening, report that activity to your health department, either on a local or state level and probably involve the CDC, and then of course help reduce the spread. When it comes to biological agents, it's very important that the nurse is using the appropriate PPE. So we're gonna talk about the three different types of spreading biological agents and what PPE would best be for each of those. So we've got contact, droplet, and airborne. So to start off, contact is where the disease is spread via direct contact with a patient or their belongings or linens, etc., such as their clothes or things like that. So the community health nurse is going to want to wear gloves, a gown, they should have dedicated equipment for their room. And you should be donning your PPE before entering the room, doffing your PPE before leaving the room, and then 100% make sure that you're washing your hands before and after entrance as well. Next up is droplet. This is disease that's spread via large particles from the respiratory systems and mucous membranes. So droplet infection is caused by those large droplets that come from an infected individual's respiratory tract. The moisture from the breath can cause it to suspend in the air. And though these droplets are heavier and tend to fall quicker than those that are considered airborne. The range for droplet infection is considered to be three to six feet. So if you're going to be in close contact with your patients, you want to make sure that, you know, that's about where your range is. And the droplets can infect another person via their mucous membranes. So that's eyes, nose, and mouth. Therefore, droplet infection means that a provider needs to protect their mucous membranes. So this includes all the same PPE as contact precautions, but it also is going to include mouth and face covering. So either a face shield and goggles, as well as a surgical mask. It's also best to have the patient wear a surgical mask as well. So gloves, gown, dedicated equipment, and then face shield and goggles, as well as a surgical mask. Then comes airborne, and this is disease that's spread via small particles from the respiratory system. So because the particles are a lot smaller than in the droplet infections, they can spread through the air for a longer time and for a further distance. Airborne pathogens can even infect individuals in separate rooms. So the PPE again is the same. So we're going to have gloves, gown, dedicated equipment, face shield, and goggles. But rather than a surgical mask, a nurse should be wearing a fit tested N95 or other respirator. The door should also be closed. And if possible, the room should be negative pressure because that can spread to other patients in other rooms. And if that's possible to have the negative pressure, the air should be circulated about 12 times an hour. Now, the biological agents can be dispersed in four different methods or weaponized in four different ways. This is done via direct contact, airborne or nuclear dispersal, water or food dispersal, and then droplet or blood dispersal. There are three categories of biological agents in addition to chemical agents. So we've got categories A, B, C, and then the chemical agents. So the A category is going to be the highest priority. This is going to be the stuff that's the most easily disseminated, easily transmitted, and causes the most mortality or death. Category B is the second highest priority, and these are moderately disseminated, 
They do have a high morbidity in that it causes disease in a high amount of people, but it has a low mortality in that not as many people die. So make sure that you understand the difference between morbidity and mortality. Category C is the third highest priority, and this is going to be things that are emerging pathogens that can be engineered and have a potential for high morbidity and mortality. This is also things that are easily accessible, such as the influenza, TB, rabies, and the hantavirus. These are things that are diseases that are easily found, but could be engineered to cause high mortality and morbidity rates. Chemical agents are pulmonary and choking agents, vesicants and blistering agents, nerve agents, and blood agents. So these have been used in the past, like choking agents were used in World War I, nerve agents were used in Japan in two terror attacks, chemical agents can be intentional or unintentional, such as like a natural disaster that causes a factory spill, such as in 2011 when Fukushima, Japan had an earthquake, which then caused a tsunami that ultimately caused a leak in the nuclear factory. So if a chemical agent is suspected, a hazmat team will need to be called in to initially address the issues. And each level, those chemical agents is going to have its own required PPE. But you as a nurse probably won't do much in wearing that PPE. Then, of course, because community health is all about prevention, let's talk about the prevention levels in bioterrorism. We've got the primary prevention and the nurse is going to be involved in potentially bioterrorism planning and drills and vaccines. The secondary level of prevention is going to be early recognition of that bioterrorism, activating the response and assisting with education. And then the tertiary levels of prevention is going to be rehabbing the survivors, evaluating the effectiveness of that treatment for them, and then also evaluating the effectiveness of the bioterrorism plan itself. Then a quick thing to have in common here is also disasters. And this is an event that requires more resources than are available. This can be man-made or natural. So a natural would be something like an earthquake or a flood or something man-made could be like Chernobyl, which was a nuclear plant in Ukraine that leaked radiation into the community. And then sometimes it can also be both, like we were talking about in Fukushima, Japan, with the earthquake, which led to the tsunami, which caused a breakdown in the nuclear plant. Then we've got disaster management. And the nurse, the community health nurse, will probably contribute in this because part of community health is being involved with all the different stakeholders. And a community health nurse is definitely a stakeholder in the health and well-being of the community. So disaster management is going to be community and government steps to prevent those disasters. So this is going to be things like earthquake safe buildings, making sure we have airport security, isolation and quarantine where needed. We need to do risk assessments. Who is going to be at risk for getting these potential bioterrorisms or disasters? Are there any history of disasters in your area? How many people would be affected by that? What responses and resources are available. So who can help when things go wrong and what's available to you when it does go wrong and what kind of evacuation is available or needed. For example, one of the communities that I used to live in had a dam that was up a mountain canyon and it's also on a fault line. And so if that fault line ever were to have an earthquake, it would cause that dam to break. And if you look it up, there are maps on where the water would reach and how deep it would be in what time period. And so some things like that are really important to do for a risk assessment so that that your community can be aware of what would happen and where the nearest hospitals are and how those hospitals might be affected by that water. And then triage. Triage is really important in disaster management. Uh, I used to work as an EMT and in that process, we had to learn how to do emergency triage. If you ever showed up to a multi-casualty accident, such as a bus rollover or something like that. And so we had training on this and on the ambulance, we had tape that we would pull out uh, to do this. So first off, we've got the emergency department triage and you're gonna see things like emergent, urgent and non-urgent. Emergent is gonna be something like a cardiac arrest and this needs to be taken care of immediately. And then we've got things like urgent, but they can wait for a few minutes. And then non-urgent issues where they're definitely going to be put at the bottom of the waiting list because there might be more urgent things that are coming in. Then with disaster triage, what we had on our ambulance was the four rolls of tape that we would pull out that connected to a fanny pack. And we had red, yellow, green, and black. Red would indicate someone who needed attention, immediate attention within the next 30 minutes to two hours. 
This would be something like internal bleeding. Yellow would indicate someone who could wait longer than two hours, but still needed a significant amount of treatment. So this might be somebody with a broken arm who will ultimately need surgery, but they can wait for a couple of hours. Green is considering what we call the walking wounded. These are minimal injuries that might require a small amount of attention, but are pretty much okay. And then black is going to be not expected to survive with the available resources. All right, then first for a quick review, bioterrorism is weaponizing biological agents. The community health nursing goal is to recognize and reduce the spread of that bioterrorism. Disasters can be natural or man-made and triage in the field can be, is going to be one of four colors, red, yellow, green, or black. Red is going to be the most emergent with the least amount of resources and black is going to be considered not expected to survive. Thanks for tuning in. Please help me grow my channel by clicking subscribe and follow below. 